All right, welcome to Go Green Will Met's April webinar. We've chosen Birds in the Garden with a terrific speaker. Her name is Pam Carlson. She is uh, a artist. She's a professional gardener, garden designer, and absolutely passionate about sharing with you how you can provide the habitat that birds and insects need for a healthy and very enjoyable yard. Um, she has a wonderful program. She has given it to many different organizations, and we are very, very pleased to have Pam Carlson with us tonight. We also have a local gardener who is quite an expert in this area who will be available during the Q&A. Her name is Amanda Nugent. Uh, many of you know Amanda, and we are delighted that we have both Pam and Amanda here tonight um, to, to share their knowledge and passion with us. And so with that, Pam? We're looking forward to your program. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, and thank you, Go Green Wilmette, for inviting me to speak uh, tonight to share my journey of turning our backyard into a bird habitat. Um, also, I wanted to mention that there is a PDF that will be shared with um, everyone. So all the plants that I discuss um, in this presentation are on this PDF, plus tons of other information. Um, and then also the, um, all the bird photographs in this presentation I took in our own backyard, except for one. Um, so my goal when we moved into our house, so this is our backyard on this opening screen shot here. Um, it was just basically grass and some scrappy trees that ended up falling down. Um, and so my goal was to turn our backyard back to nature to provide as much as possible to the birds and the pollinators, um, and also to be able to step out into nature right outside of our back door, um, just because it's so important for me to be in nature, and then also to be able to share it with our family and our friends. Um, so it's been absolutely astounding at the number of birds that have come here to uh, seek refuge and rest and refuel. Um, it's really true if you provide, they will come. And the more I added on, the more birds came and it's just been really, really amazing. So that's what I'll be sharing with you tonight is basically how did I do this? <laughs> so from there, uh, we live on the Northwest side of Chicago. Uh, we are surrounded by um, busy streets. We're half a block from the Kennedy Expressway and the Blue Line uh, leading into downtown Chicago. We are near a hospital and a fire station, so there's a lot of sirens. It's kind of noisy. We have an O'Hare runway approach that goes right over our house, so it flies literally over our head. Um, and the planes sometimes fly so low that the birds actually scatter and I'm of the opinion that they think it's a giant raptor after them. <laughs> the closest forest preserve is two miles away. Uh, and really all of our neighbors, most of our neighbors are not gardeners. So it, it truly is an oasis. Uh, and then the, the garden is in the backyard. So reason I just wanted to make sure the birds were protected from cars going by. So it's 50 feet wide by 100 feet deep but that does include a 22 by 22 foot garage in that footprint and a couple of patios um, for my large in-law family that I like to entertain. <laughs> it's uh, made up of trees, shrubs, and perennials with the majority natives. So the, um, the sweet spot you try to achieve is 70% natives or above. It's got heavy clay soil, which I no longer fight. I plant plants that adapt well to clay. We added a water feature about 17 years ago. Um, so that includes a waterfall, a stream, and a pond. I don't use any insecticides or herbicides and no rodenticides because all of that gets into the food chain. And then no fertilizers. Uh, I don't do any fall cleanup. I leave the leaves and the plant stems. And then in the spring, I do very minimal uh, spring cleanup. I just kind of trim things up and I keep the stems and I lean them up against the fence. I do some amount of home composting and um, I don't have to mulch much because of all that nice uh, dropping leaf, leaf droppings and everything um, that nutrifies the soil. But when I do expand the garden, which I'm always expanding, 
I will use uh, leaf mulch, which is a local renewable resource. Um, you'll see a lot of people spread around bark mulch and plants really don't like to grow in bark. It, if you look at it on the forest preserves, it's a, it's a bed of leaves. So that's much better for the plants. And then my husband cuts the uh, grass with a push reel mower, the old fashioned kind. We don't use any gas powered leaf blowers or edgers or weed whackers. I do everything by hand because um, we don't like the pollution. We don't like the sound pollution or the noise. And then minimal, if any, outdoor lighting, um, that is to protect all of the insects which the birds eat. So here's a good view of our backyard. Um, this is a hedgerow of lilacs, which is actually planted on our neighbor's property. Um, so that's the divider line between our, our yard and our neighbor's yard. So the stream runs down um, the side there and it dumps underneath of a land bridge behind the garage into a pond. So I am up to 124 different bird species documented, and that includes, or plus actually one subspecies, um, and that does include flyovers. So like Canada geese and sandhill cranes, uh, I count those as well. So this is just a smattering of some of the birds I photographed in our backyard. So some of the later ones that I've added, um, it's getting a little harder because it's, uh, they're more unusual species now. Um, on the left is a blue-winged warbler, a black-billed cuckoo, a great horned owl, a Eurasian collared dove, a black-throated blue warbler, a yellow-throated vireo, a roosting common nighthawk. So we get those flying over the house, but it was like a super great treat to get one roosting in our silver maple tree. A blue grosbeak, female, so I did get COVID last year and I missed a week of work and I went out to the backyard to do some birding while I was sick and boom, she showed up. So that was a real, a real treat, a little silver lining to getting COVID. So as you can see here on the map, they are from um, the Southern part of the US. And then uh, the rare subspecies that we had was a red shafted Northern flicker. So here on the eastern part of the U.S. is the uh, yellow shafted flicker. So that means underneath their wings and their tail, it's yellow. But this one, I, I was working from home and I saw this outside feeding and I was like, I, lo I love flickers. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's got red shafts. So that on the map here, you can see it was all the way from this area of the U.S. So it was way out of range. So that was a real exciting moment too. And that was added last year into the um, occur occurrence of rare birds for Illinois uh, by the Ornithological Records Committee. So very exciting. So part of the reason we have so many different birds um, is because Chicago is located on the Mississippi Flyway, which is a major migratory route. So millions of birds fly through, many using Lake Michigan. Um, as its guide as they go north. Uh, in spring, they fly up to their breeding grounds. So some of them will stick around in our area here, but many will fly north up into, into Canada, way up into the Arctic Circle. And then in the fall, the adults and juveniles now are returning south. Um, some will stick around in our area for the winter. M many, most will fly south into the southern part of the US, into Central America, way down some really far down into South America. And they do the flight in the over the Gulf of Mexico in one flight. That's a 500 mile flight. So it's remarkable what these birds can do. So roughly here in the Chicagoland area, there's been 400 different bird species documented. 300 or so bird species regularly migrate through the Chicagoland area and some will stick around and make it their temporary home. 50 or so bird species make Chicago land their permanent year round home. So those birds would be our resident birds. So that's birds um, typically like the blue jay, the morning dove, black capped chickadees, cardinals, goldfinches, robins, um, and Cooper's hawks, which eat all these other birds. <laughs> but primarily their favorite um, birds to eat are morning doves and pigeons because um, we're right by the Kennedy. So we do get occasionally some pigeons in our yard. 
Um, and then you've got your res your migratory birds. So that would be birds like scarlet tanagers, all different kinds of warblers, like black and white warblers, bay-breasted warblers, um, different types of sparrows, many, many different types of migratory sparrows, such as swamp sparrows, common yellow throats, American red starts, brown creepers, that's secretive birds down here. So part of what I was considering when I was planning um, a, the bird garden and adding to it was the different diets that the birds have. Uh, their beaks are, um, if you look at the shape of the beak, it tells you kind of what they eat. But overall, I just wanna say that almost all birds eat insects. It's such a huge part of their diet, but other they eat other um, things as well. So like rose-breasted gross beaks have a very conical beak. They love cracking nuts and shell, eating seeds and cones, uh, they'll forage in trees, on shrubs, um, on the ground, and they do come to feeders. Also, the sparrow family, they also have like a conical shaped beak, which is really good for crushing little seeds. So this is a migratory white-throated sparrow. Thin or flat beaks, such as this eastern wood peewee, they've got a very flat beak. So that they're perfect for catching insects in the air. They literally like snap their beak. You can hear it snapping in the air as they catch those insects. They'll also glean insects off of blossoms. So that would be the, the warbler family with that very fine, thin beak. Great for extracting insects off of plants as also with this blue gray gnat catcher. It's right there in the name that perfect beak for extracting insects. Then you've got your needle-like. So that's our ruby-throated hummingbird. That's the only hummingbird that lives in this part of the United States. Um, so they, it's perfect for sipping nectar. Chisel-like, that would be your woodpecker family. So this is a, a northern flicker, yellow-shafted flicker. They love ants. So that's your native ant control. Um, so if you see soil that's dispersed between pavers or the sidewalk, that's often a sign that a flicker has been feeding on ants. So they love to drill and probe into trees on the ground. They like nuts and insects and sap. Here we've got a red-bellied woodpecker, again, with that great um, beak, chisel-like beak, going into a cavity, into a tree, extracting grubs. Um, so I do encourage people, if they've got a property with a dead limb or a dead tree on it, um, if, as long as it's not going to fall on something or hurt anybody or something, if you can leave it up, great, because that's, that supplies birds with a lot of um, really nutritious food. Probing beaks, such as robins, they probe into the ground, getting earthworms and grubs. And so there's your natural grub control. And then tearing meat, that's the raptors. They, their bill is perfect for um, getting flesh off the bone. And then filtering, this is the one shot that I took in the forest preserves, but we do get um, occasionally mallard ducks on our pond. So their beaks, they're really good for sifting the water and getting little microorganisms out of the water. And then spearing, so that's your, um, your herons. This is a great blue heron. We've had green herons. So they, they spear fish and frogs. Um, so if you do get into a um, water gardening, the pond, um, don't get too attached to any fish that you might add. Don't spend a lot of money on koi. Get your fish nice and cheap because uh, you'll, most likely you will get some herons fishing in your pond, which is really cool. So many of you have probably seen uh, these headlines. The, the number of uh, uh, insect decline is huge. Uh, and that's a huge, huge problem because that's a big part of birds' diets. That leads to the bird's disappearing. So there's 3 billion birds that um, we have lost since 1970. So that's a 30% reduction in our bird population. So what are the causes of that? Um, this is a Blackburnian warbler. Um, habitat loss and fragmentation is a big part of that. So that's why it's so important for us to create habitat. Um, and the idea is to make a quilt of, of habitat for these birds to forage in. So pesticide use, it, it leads to insect decline. Um, pollution, fertilizer runoff going into the waterways and creating like choking algae blooms. Um, invasive species, different plants that are invasive. 
Cat predation is huge. That's 2.4 billion birds per year in the U.S. killed by cats. So I love cats. My cat was just walking around. <laughs> My other cat's sleeping right over there. I love, love, love cats, but indoor only. It's better for the cats and it's better for the birds. And then window strikes, 1 billion-ish per year in the U.S. Birds die. So you can amend your windows. And then uh, climate change and just the extreme weather shifts. And then perils of migration, all of that contributing to many species actually being down 50% since 1970. Here in Illinois, bottle links are down 90% since 1950. So there's two studies that are updated every few years, birds of concern and the state of the birds, um, and they give scores to the birds. Um, so the least concern is one, up to 20 being the most concerned, like in dire need of intervention. So um, 432 bird species are on a watch list and some of the birds that are on this watch list that have been in our garden are American woodcocks, black-billed cuckoo, Cape May warblers, wood thrushes, they have a beautiful song, and golden wing warblers. So as you can see, uh, the birds need all the help that we can provide. Um, there are solutions, there is hope. I've seen it in action. It's amazing. So habitat preservation and restoration is key, getting out there to the forest preserves. Doing habitat restoration work is a blast and you always learn a ton. And then changing the mindset, that's where Go, Go Green comes into play here because you're, you're working with those, those communities, changing the mindset of people to support and embrace nature where we live, in our yards, in our communities. And every time I talk about this, I get goosebumps because we can do this. This is a hermit thrush singing. So what else we can do is create this four season bird oasis in our backyard. We really have the power to make a difference. So the three main ingredients are food, water, and shelter. This is a least flycatcher. Landscaping and layers. So you want canopy trees, mid-level trees and shrubs, perennials and ground covers, and a wood or stick pile if you have space because some birds love to pick through wood and stick piles. So the reason being for all of that is that birds, some birds only feed up in the canopy, some birds only feed on the ground, and then some birds feed in between all of those layers. Here is a chipping sparrow. Plant selection. So as many native trees and shrubs as native trees, shrubs, and plants as you can. Early to late bloomers to cover all of the season. Nectar, fruit, seed, cone producing. So I just shot for diversity and variety. And then removing invasive species. This is a Nashville warbler. So I'm going to touch on invasive species. This could be a whole nother presentation that I may end up writing. But to just to name a few common ones, Japanese barberry sold everywhere. It's in tons of gardens. This is one you want to remove. It produces a berry that the birds eat. They defecate into the forest preserves. This is from the spring bird count last spring. I was in the forest preserves doing the count. I came across a sea of barberry. So this just chokes out any native plants. They can't grow. So you want to get rid of that. So other ones you want to get rid of are barberry, well, the barberry here, buckthorn, euonymus, which includes winter creeper and burning bush, privet, non-native honeysuckle, calorie or Bradford pear, lily of the valley, ground ivy, vinca vine, Asian bittersweet, miscanthus grass, which is a huge category, purple loosestripe, and that's just to name a few. Another example. Euonymus, which includes winter creeper, popular ground cover, and burning bush, that red flaming one in the fall, both are bad. They produce a berry that the birds eat. They're non-native. The birds defecate in the forest preserves. It creates a vine that climbs up the trees. It strangles the tree and it kills the tree. And the whole cycle just goes over and over again. So you want to get those out of your gardens. I just took this last week, um, Bradford pear, calorie pear, Chanticleer, it's all the same thing, non-native, decorative, ornamental tree, very popular. This is a entryway into a subdivision lined with Bradford pears. So the problem with these is they create these little berries that the birds and the um, squirrels eat. They drop them into the forest preserves next to this whole, uh, um, housing um, 
division is a, na a nature preserve. This is a shot from in the nature preserve with all these calorie pairs popping up all over the place. So ugh, that's a big problem. So get rid of those. <laughs> so back to our list, eco-friendly practices, no pesticides or denticides, no synthetic fertilizers. This is a Lincoln sparrow. It's one of my favorite migratory sparrows, very beautiful. And then supplemental support if you want to, you don't need to, but it's great if you can. So that would be like adding feeders, adding water, adding a heater in, into that water, nectar producing annuals to expend, extend the season and then nesting or roosting boxes. So here's a downy woodpecker that decided to use our wren box as a roosting box in the winter time. So I, I let that downy do that. <laughs> so I've often been asked, how did I create our habitat? So I, I've, I've, I'm a career gal, I've been working my whole adult life. So I'm gone during the day. So what do I do? I started small, I started manageable and I just expanded as I went. Time is time allowed for me. It's before work, it's after work, it's on the weekends. It's a lifestyle for me. I love, love, love it. I have to be out there doing it. Um, and then approach, have fun doing it. It's an awesome workout. It's therapeutic, it's educational, and it connects us to nature and to your neighbors. And then learning from each other. I talk to other gardeners. I try to share my knowledge freely. I attend webinars and seminars and conferences and classes. There's tons of free stuff out there. Webinars such as this, Go Green is putting on is fantastic. Um, books, garden clubs. And then looking at your own space, consider habitat zones is what I call it. So I looked around my garden. There's little microclimates within an own, your own little space. So you wanna consider those conditions to grow plants in and choosing the right plant for the right place. So do your research. Some like, like sun, some like shade, some like clay, some like fluffy loamy soil, some like dry conditions, some like moist conditions. There's so much info out there to learn. And then always refer to the Latin name of the plant. Once you decide the plant you want, refer back to the Latin to make sure you're getting the right one because the common name might get you the wrong plant. I actually made that mistake before I took classes and got my certification and learned Latin. And then planting full helps control the weeds. And I find not all plants make it. So I might buy some multiples if they're smaller size plants. And then plants have a lifespan. So you will be needing to replace some of those plants in time. And then embracing imperfection because planting native you're planting plants that are host plants to caterpillars and insects, which is great. You'll get holes in leaves. So that is a sign of success, the imperfections. And then mistakes, just learn from them. And I, when I make mistakes, I tell my, my friends about it so they can learn. And then um, change, gardens are ever evolving, your taste changes. So I'm gonna move now into the seasons and um, go through some plants that are my favorites and that do really well in our area. So spring migration starts late February and goes through mid June for the springtime. So here's our garden in early spring. And the first birds to arrive are the red winged blackbirds. <laughs> they nest down by the Kennedy Expressway. Um, so they frequent our yard and they're very vocal. So, um, Synchronicity of food sources. So during that three or so months of migration, it's not like all the different bird species are flying in throughout that those three months, like all together. They're staggered by species. So some come in really early, some come in later, and it's tied to their food sources. So for instance, the American woodcock, that's one of the earliest migrants they eat a lot of earthworms. So in the early spring, when the ground is warming up, the earthworms are percolating to the surface of the soil and that makes easy pickings. So here's that great probing beak, probing into the soil of our garden and extracting um, earthworms to eat. Later in migration, that's when the warblers are coming in. That's when insects are starting to hatch. So the, a lot of them come in in May with the warmer ten temperatures, um, the insects are hatching. So they're huge insect eaters. So here's a black and, black throated green warbler locking in on an insect and then boom, catches it. 
also ruby throated hummingbirds are excellent fly catchers. So here's one fly catching over our garden. And then it is also believed that they follow the bloom of Columbine up the US. So as they're entering into the Chicagoland area, the Columbine is coming into bloom right around May 1st, which is typically when they arrive. So in the spring, of course, all of us here in the north are dying for some color. So we put in bulbs. Um, that's great for the, for the pollinators. Um, and then so consider putting in some native bulbs. I love Kamasia. Um, it's got a gorgeous bloom um, when there, it's got a long bloom time. And then when it's all done, that foliage just dies back down, just like daffodils and tulips. So some of my favorite native early, early bloomers are Shooting Star, Mary Bells, Bloodroot, Wild Geranium. The Sedge family, Carex, is awesome. It's a very large category. And those seed heads are um, delicious food for the migrating sparrows and finches in the fall. Trilliums, Celadine Poppy, you just want to get things going nice and early. Bluebells right now are blooming everywhere. And sure enough, right around May 1st, last year, two years ago, this ruby throated hummingbird flew in and was feasting on the bluebells. So that's a really good one to get in your garden early. Nice ephemeral. One of my faves is uh, prairie smoke. Love, love, love prairie smoke. Um, really interesting flower. Here is a northern water thrush foraging amongst the foliage. It's got a great seed head. Um, so it continues to look like it's blooming even when it's done blooming. Uh, the blue star is another really good one. There's a few different types that are native to our area. Um, it's got a gorgeous icy blue flower. Here is a common yellow throat feeding amongst the blue star. Um, and in the fall, oops, in the fall, it's got this fabulous uh, golden fireworks color. If you do get into water gardening or if you've got a property that's got a um, wet spot, wet area, marshy area, you can add some native uh, water plants. So this is marsh marigold and this is a gray cat bird foraging around that. And don't confuse it for the lesser celadine, which is blooming now also, um, which is invasive and you wanna get that out of your garden. That one's hard to remove. Another good one, Ohio spiderwort. Here we've got an indigo bunting foraging amongst the foliage of that. That's a real good power working plant. Penstemon, another favorite category of mine. Um, there's many different ones to choose from. Um, this is Penstemon digitalis. I love the love this plant. It sprinkles itself around the garden. It's easy to share with friends and neighbors. Um, it's easy to edit out if you don't want it all over. But the hummingbirds really, really love this one too. Ground covers. So the idea is to get the, all these ground covers going. Um, a lot of birds just feed on the ground or most of the time on the ground, such as oven birds in this photo. Um, and so hostas, I do want to talk a little bit about non-natives. So um, I have some hostas my mom gave them to me when we moved into our house. Uh, <laughs> and as long as you have a really healthy ecosystem, you've got great food in your, in your soil for the, uh, the ground feeding birds. So the um, oven birds actually feed underneath the hostas. So it's okay to have some hostas in there. Uh, other native ground covers that I absolutely love. I love plantain leaved pussy toes. Um, I saw this as a kid um, camping and I was thrilled to find it at native plant sales um, quite a few years ago now. So I've got a nice big patch of it. Turns out it is the host plant for American lady and um, American lady and painted lady butterflies. So here's one of their caterpillars in there. Um, and I, I tell you what, I know I'm the only one on the block that's got this uh, native plant in our garden. So um, it's amazing that the, they can find them. Alum root, that's our native hookera. Uh, wild violets, leave those violets. Um, it, they're free. They're very pretty. They're blooming now. And they're also um, host plants to butterflies and moths. Wild ginger. So you want our native one, a sarum canadense. It's got a dull leaf versus the European one, which is the shiny leaf. So you want to go for our native one. It has this flower that blooms underneath the leaf. So you literally have to flip that leaf under over to see it. But it attracts little insects that um, ground feeding birds like oven birds then can pick off. 
Again, the Carex family is excellent for birds, excellent for your garden, excellent for your soil. Uh, wild strawberry. So you want to make sure you're getting again. Look at the look at the Ital or the Italian, the Latin, um, to make sure you're getting the right wild strawberry, which is a white flower, great for birds. And then wild stone crop. It's our own native sedum to our area. It's got fabulous flowers, um, great ground cover. So then two, um, when you're walking around the hood, <laughs> and you see a really cool log that's on the street or on the sidewalk that broke off of a tree, consider bringing it home like I do. It's free sculpture. It's really beautiful, really natural. And it, as it breaks down, it adds tons of nutrients to the soil. And it also um, is a place for birds then to eat because it has insects inside of it. So just let these plants all intermingle. I mean, this is such a smorgasbord here with Virginia bluebells. Columbine, beard tongue, prairie smoke on the left. On the right, we've got Canada anemone, foam flower, spider wart, common oak sedge. Um, just really pretty to let that all intermingle. And then lawns. So the idea with the lawns is consider reducing, eliminating, or replacing um, with eco friendly. There's, you know, some of the sedges can, um, native sedges can actually substitute for lawn. If you do decide to keep lawn, just don't treat it. Our lawn looks great. It's green, it's beautiful. It's got blooming violets in it, it's got clover. Um, and since we don't treat it, it has tons of microorganisms for the birds to feed on. So these ground feeding birds like brown thrashers, fox sparrows, palm warblers, they just have a feast on our lawn. So don't treat those lawns. <laughs> And then um, some of my favorite blooming trees that do really well in our area that we've got in our garden, serviceberry, amelanchier, native to um, all states except one state. So um, they produce, they bloom early. They produce a berry that the birds love. So robins, thrushes, cedar wax wings. You can eat it too. It's delicious, but I, I let the birds eat it. And then fabulous fall color. When I was doing a lot of research on a bird tree, I kept coming up with hawthorn. Um, so I chose a winter king hawthorn, which blooms a little later in May when the warblers are flying in. Then it also produces a berry that the birds love. And this clings to the tree. It's pretty much picked off by the end of February. So that's a really long time to be feeding the birds. So here in the winter king hawthorn, we've got a magnolia warbler with that awesome fine beak for picking insects off of buds. So um, it was, they feast um, it, on all those little insects that are attracted to the um, blossoms. So with, with a balanced ecosystem, it's not like you're gonna be inundated with all these insects in your backyard. It's because they're getting eaten by birds, by dragonflies, um, the whole ecosystem is functioning really well. Other really good trees to add are dogwood trees. Uh, this is a black pole warbler in our dogwood and that's the male on the right. So uh, dogwoods produce a very fattening, nutritious berry that ripens up in the fall for the, um, the birds then as they are uh, migrating back south uh, to feast on. So that's a great category is dogwoods. So the higher, taller canopy trees you wanna consider are oaks, cherries, willows, maples, elms. Oaks are pretty much number one because it's such a huge host plant. Um, so here's a, a Baltimore Oriole up in our silver maple tree. A lot of birds like to only feed in those high canopies. Orioles like to come and check out their surroundings before they fly down into the lower areas to feed. So because our yard is smaller, I added a dwarf chickapin oak. And then I also added, this will get tall, but I had the space for it, a black cherry. Our neighbors have a uh, honey locust tree that hangs over our yard. And here we've got an orange crown warbler feeding amongst that. So conifers, uh, evergreens, another important component to a bird garden. We're super lucky because a lot of our neighbors have very tall conifer trees. So um, such as this Colorado blue spruce, a couple yards down produces these great um, cones. So a lot of, some birds 
eat cones. They'd bust them open and get those seeds inside, such as these white winged crossbills. That's male and female in our garden. And then, so since our garden is smaller, I added some smaller sized uh, cultivars. So I added a globe blue spruce. Um, still, it provides some shelter for the birds to um, bottom feed underneath there on the ground. This is an eastern towhee and then the wood thrushes. They love to feed underneath those evergreens. Also, cooper's hawks, they'll, they'll use it for hunting. Um, there's a nice smaller size juniper shrub called gray owl. Um, I'm a big fan of that one, and it produces the berries that the birds love. Also, raptors use tall evergreens as lookout points, such as this merlin. So it's nice to give them those lookout points. And then also the sap that is produced um, from these evergreens. Uh, it, the sap attracts little tiny insects that kinglets go crazy for. So we've got the golden crown kinglet on the left and the ruby crown kinglet on the right. And these, these, this tree, this Norway spruce will get covered with kinglets. Um, junipers, another great tree. Our juniper is original to the house maybe before our house was built in 1949. So this tree is at least that old. It produces a lot of juniper berries. So thrushes, robins, waxwings all love um, those berries. And then uh, the yellow-bellied sapsuckers, which is a migratory woodpecker, they drill holes into the bark and it, obviously it's not killing the tree because it's been around since 1949. Um, sap excretes from those holes and that attracts little tiny insects. So he's getting like a double meal then. Shrubs, um, there's lots of really good native shrubs that are butterfly host plants that produce flowers and fruits for the birds to eat. Here we've got a chestnut sided warbler resting on one of our shrubs. So if you do have the invasive species non-native honeysuckle, that produces these red berries. They're everywhere and they get all over the forest preserves. Take those out. You can replace it with our native honeysuckle. So this is on the list. It produces a, a, bear, um, a beautiful flower that the, bird, the hummingbirds love. Um, it gets a gorgeous fall color and it's host plant to some butterflies as well. Viburnums are excellent. This is a, uh, a common uh, yellow throat in, in a viburnum. I'm sorry, American Red Start. And the viburnums create berries that the birds love too. So there's all different kinds, types of viburnums, which are excellent category. Other good ones are um, sumacs, winterberry, dogwoods, witch hazels, spice bush. There's so many to choose from. Other ones that we've got in our garden, elderberry on the left. The birds go nuts for these berries. Super fun to watch them. And then chokeberry, another category. There's different sizes that you can get. They produce a great berry for the birds. I'm going to talk just a touch on cultivars because I know that can be a controversial area for, for some people. Um, but if you have a small space, that's where I feel like some cultivars, it's acceptable to do so. For instance, we'd see, we've got such a small yard, I wanted a variety. So Clethra olifolia, the native one, the straight species gets quite large as does buttonbush. The straight species is like eight to 10 feet big, large. So I went with the cultivar um, hummingbird for the summer sweet, and it still gets covered with pollinators and the hummingbirds love it. And then for buttonbush, I chose sugar check because that, that only gets four by four. Still the pollinators love it and the hummingbirds love it. So then, Lilacs, a lot of us have lilacs. Um, I've seen hummingbirds and Baltimore Orioles feeding from the nectar of the lilacs. So don't feel like you've got to break the bank and remove all of your lilacs. Um, you can take out some and put in some natives, but there is something to be said about that wonderful scent. So here um, resting in the lilac is a Wilson warbler. This is a blue headed vireo preening and resting in the lilac and cedar waxwing as well. So they use it to fly catch out of. With a healthy habitat, you have lots of nesting material. Here's a common grackle, and I know a lot of people don't like them, but yes, their numbers are declining as well, quite steeply. They're beautiful birds. So here's one collecting nesting material in our garden. Here's a red-breasted nuthatch getting strips of wood off the juniper. 
And then part of the reason that you want to save your, spe- your stems and leave them leaning against your fence is because inside those stems is this soft pith. A lot of birds use that pith to nest build from. And of course, bees and insects hibernate inside those stems. Um, here is a robin. And she's actually built her nest on our neighbor's downspout outside of our kitchen window across the way there. Um, I watched her collect like all of her dusting material from our backyard, mud, grass, everything. So moving into summer, some of my favorite summer natives, Liatris is an excellent category. There's many different kinds to choose from. Great vertical um, presence in the garden. Pollinators love them. Other really good heavy hitters here, bee balm. So that's Eastern bee balm, scarlet bee balm, wild bergamot, Joe pie weed, wild petunia, cup plants, royal catch fly. Um, for sun, shade, everything. Um, goat's beard is great for shade. And then um, phlox, excellent for shade. Cardinal flower, so we've got great blue lobelia and lobelia cardinalis. Both are excellent for hummingbirds. Uh, a rattlesnake master, awesome, awesome structure in the garden that pollinators love. And then don't forget about milkweeds as well. There's lots of different milkweeds to choose from. The ones I've had really good success with are swamp, common, and butterfly. And we get quite the nursery back there. We get the entire life cycle of the monarch. Um, I actually, uh, National Geographic came out and photographed in our garden last August because they're writing an issue on monarch, the plight of the monarch. Um, and we just so happened to have this chrysalis on our dogwood. So one of our shrubs. So that was really cool. So, and then volunteers, some people consider flea bane a weed, but it's an awesome native plant and it's cheerful in the garden, has great seed heads on it in the fall for migrating um, finches and sparrows. So let all that stuff, plants mix together. Here we've got another smorgasbord here with bee balm, black-eyed Susan, purple coneflower. And when all of that goes to seed, it's gonna be great feasting for the birds. Adding uh, annuals to the mix is a good way to extend the season. So you, you can't go wrong with salvia. Uh, so what I do is I, I make pots with plants just for hummingbirds. So when the weather gets cold in the fall, I'll bring them inside our unheated garage when it's gonna frost, and then I'll put them back out on the patio to extend the season for the migrating hummingbirds because they can migrate super late. Um, you'll see in a later slide, we had one on November 11th once. So, um, and, and don't forget about going vertical with, with vines. You've got cardinal creeper vine, um, passion flower, firecracker vine. So there's all sorts of really fabulous vines for hummingbirds. And then with a um, healthy habitat, you'll have a lot of baby birds feeding in your garden. We get tons of them. Here is a, a, a father, American robin male feeding his baby. Um, so the male and the female robin raise their young. They're really good parents. And Cardinals as well, male and female, they raise their young. So last season was a boon year, I swear. There were so many baby cardinals in our garden. I took this last season. And then house wrens, it's really fun to hang up house wren boxes. And you can put these metal plates on the pole to keep invasive house sparrows out. Um, so we get two to three broods each season. Um, and their song is just unbeatable. Um, so bubbly and happy. And then some later season nesters are cedar waxwings. So, um, you know, when the, if you're seeing some baby waxwings in your garden, you're e edging up now towards the fall. So here's a juvenile feeding on the juniper berries. And American goldfinches as well, um, late nesters. So towards getting later in the season, um, this is the dad feeding the babies there. So now moving into the fall, our garden is just chock full of seeds, tons of food there for the migrating um, going back south. So I'm gonna cover just a few really good uh, per native perennials for the fall. Um, so obedient plant, another good one, you can deadhead this one, it will rebloom. So there is a hummingbird that was feeding on uh, obedient plant. Ironweed is great, monk's hood. Um, the Rudbeckia is a Rudbeckia is a huge category. There's so many Rudbeckias to choose from. This one is cut leaf coneflower. 
great category, great seed heads for, for the uh, birds. And then you can't go wrong with all these native, uh, all these native grasses. This is prairie drop seed because those seeds are so important for the migrating birds. And then also um, butterfly bush has been placed on the invasive species list as well. People love their butterfly bushes. And I know that one's hard to pull out of your garden, but it has become a problem south of here, especially. Um, so a nice substitute for that is our native Agastache. This, um, there's a couple of them. This one is Anise. Um, and the, the bloom is actually very similar to, but, uh, to uh, butterfly bush. Blooms around the same time. Um, and it's great for pollinators and hummingbirds. Flocks, you can deadhead flocks and it reblooms in the fall then for the migrating hummingbirds and later pollinators. And here's a Tennessee warbler feeding amongst the foliage of the flocks. Also a good one, turtle head. So it comes in white, Chelone glabra, and then it also comes in pink, the lion eye. Um, so here is a hummingbird feeding on that, the bumbles love it, and a red-eyed vireo it, feeding amongst the foliage as well. Jewelweed, some people consider it a weed. Uh, I don't, I love this plant, I've loved it since I was a kid. It does really well in moist soils, like uh, we have it around our stream. Um, and so it comes into bloom right when the hummingbirds are migrating south. So it's got a great long bloom time and it's really easy to pull the little seedlings out. It does make a lot of seedlings, but you can manage it. The aster family, another really broad, excellent category. Um, I love, love, love this white wood aster. It does great in um, shade, dark, uh, dry shade soil, uh, gets covered with flowers. Uh, and then it has this beautiful seed head um, that it looks like it's blooming even when it's done. Solidago, that's your um, goldenrod family, another really good one. Uh, there's some for shade, there's some for sun. Um, don't grab the one that grows in your alley because that one is too aggressive. Uh, there is one, uh, a cultivar called fireworks that behaves itself a lot more. I've had that in our garden for a long time, still gets chock full of pollinators and good for the migrating butterflies. So you will also with a healthy habitat get spiders in your garden, um, which are great insect control. And a lot of birds do use spider webbing for building their nests. Um, I love this blue mist flower. This one volunteered in our garden. It creates this cloud blue in the, in the fall. Um, and then the migrating butterflies just love feasting on that. It's a real good one. And you can edit that one out very easily. Got a shallow root system. So then two, also water gardening, you can add native hibiscus into the water. Um, here we've got an Eastern Phoebe resting on the hibiscus. It turns a beautiful yellow in the fall, the, the leaf. Um, but you can also plant this in the soil as well. Uh, oh my gosh, Aurelia spikenard. This is a fabulous herbaceous perennial that gets quite large, kind of shrub-like appearance, but it dies all the way down um, in the winter. Uh, it's great for the fall because it produces this berry that the, um, the thrushes go crazy for. So that's a Swainson's thrush. And then also a popular vine is sweet autumn clematis. You wanna remove that, that's actually from Asia, and you can replace it with clematis virginiana, which is our native um, autumn blooming uh, or late summer autumn blooming vine that, that looks just like it really. Um, and then also intertwined, I have Virginia creeper in there. That's really good because it produces a berry that the birds love in the fall. And then um, just let those volunteers come on in, snake root. Um, I do edit this one a bit, but it's great for the um, late migratory butterflies. Uh, asters pop in, this is New England aster with a little metallic bee. Um, this, <laughs> Pokeweed grows in our alley and it jumped over a couple of years ago into our garden um, and it produces a fragrant flower and it gets quite tall. So I keep it towards the back of the garden. You can pull the seedlings out in the front of the garden. The reason I keep it is because it produces this berry. It turns all purple. And in the fall, the migrating thrushes go crazy for it. So here's a gray cheeked thrush and he was feasting on it. because You can see that little drip of the pokeberry juice on its beak. So leave up those seed heads. It, it, it's so much food for the birds. 
The swamp milkweed has a beautiful crane's head shape. Rose mallow, really interesting seed head. Doll's eyes, the birds love the berries. And then again, you can't go wrong with these native grasses like little blue stem and purple love grass, great seeds for the birds. A cone flower, that's one of the favorite seeds of finches. So leave those cone flowers up all through the winter. It'll be picked clean by the spring. And then leaves. Many of you probably have heard leave the leaves. So the idea is rake your leaves into your garden beds because that they break down. It adds tons of nutrients to the soil. In the spring, uh, it protects plants. And then in the spring, when the robins and thrushes are migrating in, they flip those leaves upside down, just as this robin is doing. And there's all those insects that have been hibernating under there that they can feast on. So here we've got the robin doing it, white-throated sparrows doing the same thing oven birds finding like all these little worms in there. The leaves are so important. I watched this Viri doing the exact same thing and then perched in our juniper and rested. So those leaves are really, really important. So a leaf, it's not just a leaf. Um, I found this sycamore leaf on the ground in the winter and I turned it over and it had a polyphemus moth cocoon on it. So those, those leaves are home to moths and butterflies and cocoons. They're really important. So I saved the cocoon and I put it in a butterfly tent in our unheated garage. And in the spring, it hatched into a polyphemus moth that I, was, I released. So that's why it's so important to save these leaves. And then don't be afraid of fungus that might show up in your garden as well. This is bird nest fungus that grew in our bird garden. <laughs> so the beauty is astounding. And so the fungus break helps, helps all that material break down, sends it down into the earth and really neutrifies it. So moving now into winter, when the dark eyed juncos are returning, you know, winter is right around the corner. That's our, our garden in the winter. Um, all that foliage is up and creates habitat for birds and insects to hibernate in. And then the berries are really ripening up. Um, so the winter king hawthorn on the left and the winter berry on the right. And then we get huge flocks of finches. I'm talking like a hundred finches. I'm not kidding. So gold house and the occasional purple and then if they're in the area, we get pine siskins and red poles. We get the occasional American tree sparrow in the winter, which is a really good bird tree for Chicago or bird um, garden bird for Chicago. It's just really good. Um, and then red breasted nuthatches. So what happens sometimes there's these eruptions. So that would be up north if there's a depletion of food. Um, some of these birds that typically stay <clears throat> up north more, um, they will come farther south into the Chicago area and you might get a huge abundance of these birds. So the red-breasted nuthatch is one of them. Some years there's tons. Pine siskins, same thing. Some years we get tons of pine siskins, some years we don't see any. Same thing with the, uh, uh, the red poles. Some years we get a ton, some years we don't get any. And white-winged crossbills two winters ago, we got quite an influx of them in our area. So that was a real treat to see them in the garden. So adding water to the garden is um, really essential. If you can do it, it helps a ton. It brings, it brings in other types of birds as well. Um, so here's the pine siskins drinking in our, in our stream, loving it, having a party. So ways you can add it to your own garden are through plants, which is what I did initially before we put in the um, water feature. So you could do cup plant. Um, this plant can be aggressive in some gardens. It's not in ours. So you do have to watch it, but um, it's a native plant. The reason I planted it is because it, it collects water in its little cup shaped leaves. So um, birds can feed off of it. Pollinators love the seeds um, and, the, and the flowers. Um, birds eat the seeds. Uh, this is a yellow warbler. And then another idea would be um, some of these heavier leaved cup shaped hostas. That's another way to catch water um, if you don't want to put in a water feature. But if you, if you do want to put in a water feature, there's 
all different water features for different budgets. So you could do a bird bath in the, and put a heater in it. You could do a container garden like my sister did. This is hers. She made it herself. You can do a fountain. You could do a pondless waterfall. So this is our waterfall, but they sell kits where all it is is just a recycling waterfall. Um, this is my mom's neighbor's recycling pondless waterfall. And my mom's neighbor also has this bubbling rock. There's a reservoir under it. It just recycles that water around and around. And then you can do you know, a stream and a pond if you want to go hog wild. So, so if you, if you do um, add a pond, you may get lots of uh, dragonflies, like this green darner dragonfly in our garden laying her eggs. We get the whole life cycle. We get the nymphs and that's your natural mosquito control. That's their favorite food is mosquitoes. So we get green darners, we get blue dashers, we get white-faced meadowhawks, we get 12 spotted skimmers, um, this beautiful ebony jewel wing, that's just a few. And then when you add water, the show is amazing. The birds will thank you. You'll have a blast watching them. American Red Start. Uh, this is a morning warbler. A Louisiana water thrush feeding on our inner stream. Oh my gosh, yellow warblers, they love water. And of course, our state bird, Northern Cardinal and Blue Jay, beautiful. They use it for hygiene, bathing, um, and then adding, um, if you want to feed the birds, you can do that. I do. Um, so if you hang bird feed or hummingbird feeders, you want to get that, you can put them out now if you want. Typically, they start arriving May 1st in our area. And then I keep mine up through November because the latest sighting I ever had in our garden was November 11th. And it was a ruby-throated hummingbird um, that I did have Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, documented it. Um, if you want to be the Orioles, you could do oranges and grape jelly. They love that. So here's Baltimore Orioles feeding on the grape jelly and oranges. You may even get orchard Orioles feeding on that as well. So this is a first year male on the left. They're yellow and they mature to a rusty color in, in their second year. And then just there's all different types of feeders. Just do your research. Um, some birds just love eating nuts like nut, nut, nut hatches and woodpeckers, blue jays. Um, the finches absolutely love uh, the thistle seed. Um, so you'll get siskins, goldfinches, red poles, even downies will eat that. And then suet, all different styles of suet feeders. The woodpeckers love it, the nut hatches love it. I particularly like the style with the hood over it because um, then the starlings and the house finches won't decimate it. <laughs> you can spend a lot of money on suet. Um, so I do a whole nother talk just on feeding birds that show up at bird feeders in, in the Chicagoland area. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, a great uh, source uh, in, in Glenview is the Wild Birds Unlimited. Tim Joyce is the manager there. So um, he's awesome, super duper duper knowledgeable, super nice. Um, so I re always recommend that store because they're you want fresh, fresh food for birds, fresh and keep it clean and dry. Um, so they're, they're a great source for bird food. And then other side benefits of a bird garden, it brings in the pollinators. So bumblebees, tigerfly bees, cicadas, which are big um, food for birds, cicada killer wasps, katydids, tons of butterflies, monarchs, eastern tiger swallowtails, blue black swallowtails, spicebush swallowtails, pipevine swallowtails, admirals, painted ladies, all different kinds of skippers, azures, pearl crescents, morning cloaks, commas, question marks. I mean, gosh, it just goes on and on and on. And then moths, also important part of birds' diets. This is called the bride. It was really big. Sphinx moths, which are um, like, they call them hummingbird moths because people mistake them for hummingbirds. Really fun to watch. This is a clear wing sphinx. And then beetles, this is a grapevine beetle. And then tons of ladybugs and tons of lightning bugs. And they are, ladybugs are natural aphid scale and mite control. And, and lightning bugs eat snails and slugs. I mean, who knew? So they're just this balanced ecosystem. So 
other benefits, of course, it's so fun <laughs> and it's so good for you. There's so many health benefits um, for us, for the environment, for the community. Um, this is a white breasted nuthatch. And then your educational opportunities for myself, these are my nieces and nephews. They love our garden. Um, they're getting a little older now, but you know, my, my dream is that they will have native gardens of their own. In fact, one of my older nieces does. And then community science, you can do Project Feeder Watch, Great Backyard Bird Count, Global Big Day, and eBird. Um, you just put in all your data that you record in your backyard and the, um, the scientists really truly use all that data. So this is me typically, um, this is my happy hour <laughs> in the backyard. And then a couple organizations that are really good. You can get a native garden registered, which I did with Conservation at Home, really great program through um, University of Illinois Extension. And then Doug Tallamy also has one you can register um, to see the pack, patchwork grow. So good books, and these are all on this pamphlet that I prepared. Um, good books, Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, and Nature, uh, Nature of Oaks, all by Doug Tallamy. Our garden is featured in Nature's Best Hope as an example of um, the power of urban lots. Birdscaping in the Midwest is a good one too. Grow Now by Emily Murphy, very practical, really good book, came out last year. She also made a um, visit to our garden and included our garden as an example of gardening for wildlife and rewilding. So I recommend that book too. And then if you get into Bird ID, Sibley's Guide to Birds is great. And Cornell Lab of Ornithology, all about birds. And this is a white crowned sparrow. <laughs> and together we can totally make a difference building these habitats. So enjoy the birds and thank you so much. So from here, I can take questions. <laughs> okay, great. Can you can you hear me? I can. Okay, super. Oh my gosh, Pam, that I that is such a treat to watch that program. I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we've got questions. I took some notes. Um, so now you are all welcome to stay on. As long as we've got people on, we will keep asking questions of you and we will conclude at the very latest at 8.30. Um, but Pam, you are so inspiring. It's amazing to see what you have done. I love the photo of you, how close you are to the Eden's Expressway. And, and when you extrapolate and think what could happen if more and more people do what, what you've done. And I know we have people in Wilmette, like Amanda Nugent, who's on, who um, has also done extraordinary things, rewilding her yard. Um, so I'm going to go to the Q&A, and I also have some questions. So um, we will try to answer as many of these. Oh, uh, Wendy Sharon, who's organized the Repair Cafe, reminded me the Repair Cafe is this Saturday, not Sunday. It's at St. John's Church across from the library from 10 to 1. Um, so a, a few quick recommendations for very shady yards because we have fabulous trees in Wilmette and um, many of us have very shady yards. Can you give us just a few examples of what, what you can do in a shady yard? Oh my gosh, there's so much you can do in a shady yard. <laughs> don't let it intimidate you. Um, on, the, on the list that I prepared, I don't know if you can see this or not, but um, there's a lot of shade uh, plants in here because I do have a shady spot in our garden. So um, gosh, a lot of the early ephemerals that are blooming right now, like um, you know bluebells and, and wild geranium and a lot of the carexes, um, Oh gosh, and shrubs, there's shrubs that can take shade. The native um, uh, honeysuckle can take some shade. Aronias can take some shade. Um, even dogwoods can take some amount of shade. Some of viburnums can take some amount of shade. Um, gosh, turtle head, that what I covered in, 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 in the presentation here, that can take shade. Flax takes shade. I mean, there's, there is, a, wild ginger is excellent. Um, for a ground cover, all the ferns, there's tons of ferns that can take them like a maidenhair fern and Christmas fern. And oh my gosh, just look at that list. <laughs> okay, great. The list that she's referring to, she's very generously sharing her list that she has curated. 
that is going to be posted to the Go Google Met uh, website. But you also, as participants, will get an email directly from probably Zoom, and it's going to have a link to that list on it. It might be Friday, not tomorrow, because um, it might take us till we'll get it uploaded. We're also going to include a link to the recording. Um, you can always find it on the YouTube channel. I'm sure many of you watch this thinking, wow, so-and-so ought to see this too. Please be sure to refer them to our YouTube channel. Okay, quick question. Someone want to know whether this passion flower really native? It's native um, south of here. So um, I actually, you know, with the, with climate change and where I have it planted, it looks to me like ours might actually have survived the winter. Um, so some of the plants that are more native south of us, it, 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 there's the whole issue. Is it Chicago native? Is it Illinois native? You know, it's a how particular you are um, to describe a native uh, but so, yes, it does grow south of here. Again, check the Latin, the one you're buying. You want to make sure it is the one that grows in Illinois. Um, so, but gosh, with all this, with the way things are heating up here, some of the plants that are more native to, to the south of us actually might become more native right here in the Chicagoland area as well. Okay. Um, got a couple of compliments on your amazing photography, which oh. is just have you always enjoyed pho photographing your garden? Oh yeah. Well, especially birds. Um, I'm not professionally trained. I, I'm, I, I'm a career artist. I went to art school for a living, but I didn't take photography in art school, even though they had it. I took drawing and graphic design and everything. But, um, so I just, I consider myself an amateur, but I, I'm very passionate about it. So <laughs> beautiful. Amanda Nugent does extraordinary photography in her garden. She has an Instagram post that, uh, highlights, you know, my days almost every day when I see her photography. Um, okay, so I've got so many different things I want to make sure I'm going to get some of these questions, but I'd like to ask you about a couple of things that I want to make sure people are really clear about. You mentioned that there's a problem with outdoor lighting. Can you yes. talk a little more about that, please? Yes. So it's there's so much outdoor lighting. Oh my gosh, people are, it's, Oh, it's a real problem because what happens, it's similar to birds. I do migratory bird rescue. I've been doing it since 2004. So it's similar to birds, but like the Sears tower, for instance, let's take, it used to be lit up during migration. They, they turn the top off now, but birds get attracted to those lights and they, they fly around and around and around and around and they get, they exhaust themselves and they fall to the ground and many of them perish. Same thing with insects. They get attracted to all those lights and they fly around and around and around and they exhaust themselves and, and die. So it's, it's just really, I mean, I'm not a scientist. You, you can delve more into this on a scientific level and read Doug Tallamy's books because he really talks about it more in depth on a scientific level, but it's, it's co contributing, contributing significantly to the decline of insects, which affects the entire food chain. So okay. dim those lights, dim those lights. And even and in just, a, just a quick comment to add to that is um, that it's most important to turn off your backyard lights in the migratory periods when the birds are really coming and traveling through. So, yes. um, so May, what is it, Pam? It's May through June or, or a, sorry, April through June or something like that. Yeah, it actually, it actually starts, migration starts here in Chicago, like late February and it goes, okay. to, it goes to like mid June, but the, but the prime months are April the woodcocks are really coming in March too. So if you could turn them off like March, April, Most May, of the year. <laughs> April, and, March, then April, May the, and then again in the fall. And they get in the fall. Yeah. So Chicago does that. They have a lights out program in Chicago, which is great. Oh, okay. That's good for people to know that it really does matter in their yards. Just huge. The bare minimum lights, really, really important. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what happens when someone's yard service regularly uses leaf blowers to uh, blow their gardens clean and tidy. Tell um, us about that, please. It's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> drives, me, <laughs> drives me crazy. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've actually, and, and another issue too is like those mosquito treatment people. Um, I, I do 10 gardens uh, for a living, some of my clients, and I've, I've been known to 
talk to the mosquito sprayer guys because uh, I see all the all the insects that die as a result of the mosquito spraying. It doesn't just kill mosquitoes; it kills a lot. So yeah, with the leaf blowers, um, if if people can just embrace leaves, d don't treat them as the enemy, and see the beauty. Like I hopefully I showed that in this presentation. There, there's so much wonderful benefits of leaves and how much they contribute to the nutrients of the soil in your garden and the health of your garden and the insects and the beneficial insects, um, lightning bugs. Um, there, there's just so many reasons to keep them. So I would encourage people if they have a lawn service, um, have them stop doing that. And not to mention the pollution that comes off of those gas blowers. Oh my gosh, they're huge pollutants, huge, huge, huge. Um, and the noise factor as well. So I, I'm hoping that more and more suburbs, I know where some of them are doing this, are actually putting a ban to some of those leaf blowers, which I think is a great idea. So right. go back to old fashioned raking. It's, it's fun and it's really good exercise. <laughs> Every time I see blown, like soil is not supposed to be gray, hard, and bare. That right. is unhealthy soil. And that has become the uh, the standard treatment of yards. Um, so you talk, you brought up a pet peeve of mine. That's the backyard mosquito spraying, which is becoming more and more popular. It's practically unregulated. It's disastrous. And yet people believe that they're doing a, a good thing by by doing that so let's leave mosquito treatment to the north shore mosquito abatement district those guys have their phds they're really good at it the backyard pay to spray companies are very problematic um okay also one more thing uh standard yard care very often includes the standard package if you're not reading the the small print we'll have broadleaf uh weed killer Ooh. Tell us what happens when you treat your yard with that, Pam, please. I'm not an expert on, on using all that stuff because I don't use it, <laughs> but I just know it's bad. It, it's, it, can, it can, especially if it's not um, treated properly, you can get a lot of drift that, you know, if it's done on a, a windy day, can, I've actually experienced this recently. I, I think, I think maybe one of my neighbors used it and it, has affected some of my plants, but it, it drifts and blows into unintentionally into other people's yards, um, killing the beneficial plants. Um, it's just too wide scope. Um, so I, I'm just not a fan. I'm I'm more into eradication by hand. Um, I help some some people that I tend gardens for thankfully embrace that approach, and we just do it by hand and weed all that stuff out by hand. So it is, it is doable. Okay, great. Thanks. Now we have some questions about ponds. Um, Amanda, can you tell us about the pond that you did, Pam, is gorgeous. Amanda, do you want to give us a short description of, of your pond? Please. <laughs> well, our pond is nothing like what Pam's looks like. Um, it started out as a project for our high schooler at the time. Um, and we did it all ourselves. Um, I would say that it, it's been a, it was a wonderful undertaking, but not easy. I would say it's not easy. Um, and there are so many different, uh, ways to go about it. Um, I found Lurvies out in, um, on Dempster to be a really great source of help and, and product. We used their products pretty much, um, exclusively. And they spent a ton of time with us, walking us through a lot of different things. Um, and, and I just love it. I mean, ours doesn't draw the same, maybe the same, but, uh, variety, but, um, but we did have a great blue heron in the backyard <laughs> yesterday, um, <laughs> looking for our fish. Um, and, uh, it's just incredible to see the birds all winter. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that's really important about water that we didn't talk about is um, making sure that if you do have bird baths to clean out your bird baths. And that's true for the feeders as well. And the houses, like all yeah. those things, we think about them as being something that we um, just enjoy and, and that's it. We fill it with water and that's it. But it's really, really important um, to clean out your bird bath, both for, um, keeping, you know, getting rid of mosquito larvae, but also, 
um, in case any um, diseases or mold. I mean, we wouldn't want to be drinking out of moldy sitting, you know, water that had been there for a week. So really important to clean out your bird baths, clean out your bird feeders, um, especially when we had that big avian yes. um, flu scare. Um, a couple, when was that last? L last fall. Last fall. Yeah. So like I took all my feeders down. So it's really important to just sort of keep on top of the news in that way so that if there is an alert, you can handle your um, your backyard feeders and ponds and stuff um, properly. Yes, I, I agree 100%. I, I, um, I do a whole nother talk on that specifically and you know, uh, care of bird feeders and all that. Um, but there, that slides, people can go back on the slide where I show like the different types of food. They can pause that slide and I kind of outline that too, like keeping it clean, keep, cleanliness is huge. And I would echo that Tim at the Wild Bird Store is just the best guy. He knows his stuff. He's so friendly um, and passionate about our local birds and, and talks about what birds are where and who spotted yep. what bird, you know, exciting bird on the North Shore. And um, so they're just, he's incredible. So that's my go-to place as well. Yeah. Awesome. So do you have a... Um... Okay, someone has a question. How important is it to have fish in your pond if the herons are going to eat them anyway? Oh, <laughs> it's just fun. <laughs> fun. Okay. I mean, you don't have to. You don't have to have fish in your pond, but it is fun. Um, when we when we had had we actually had ours installed because it's pretty big. I mean, kind of big. Um, we had Aquascape do ours, and I wanted to put in uh, bluegill, like nap, like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he, he was like you're never going to see them they're going to hide so he's like just go get some feeder you know feeder fish from the pet store and then they just multiplied so we have so many little um goldfish that that's what they mostly and then I don't spend a lot of money on koi I just get yeah. cheap, cheap 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 ones and so they'll get they'll grow but then we lose them and yeah so and, you, and but we you just, don't have to do that if you don't want right. to and we designed our our pond specifically to be able to one, um, not, you know, so that we could have fish all winter in Chicago. Yes. So there were, you know, depth requirements, you know, it has to be at least three feet. Um, and we took extreme care as we laid it out to make sure that there were lots of hidey holes yes. so that the fish can, um, you know, dodge, um, the herons or yes. the raccoons. Exactly. Um, so, so that's another, that's another tip. There's tons of information on do-it-yourself backyard ponds on YouTube as well. Okay. I know, I know from seeing Amanda's garden that you also love salvia and you add annual salvia. Um, I do. In both of you, both of you do that. Um, oh, so I just wanted to mention that that for people who are trying to get more familiar with what a plant is, there's an app called Picture This. It does cost $30 a year. It's the best $30 I spend. It's an amazing resource. It's right about 98% of the time. And it really helps you learn what's in your garden. Or if you're on a walk and you see something you like, you simply point your phone to it and you will get information about that plant. So picture this is really handy. Um, and and, uh, Beth, while you're talking about apps, I would say that the Merlin app Mm -hmm. um, is another must have because you can go on a walk in Gilson park or wherever you may be, and you can hear a bird and not have any idea what it is. And the Merlin app can, um, is really pretty amazing at identifying it. And what my, uh, youngest has discovered is you can play back the noises, the sounds, and the birds, you can actually talk to the birds. The birds will communicate back to the sounds that you're playing from your phone. It's been really fun to watch um, to watch our kid do that. Awesome. I also wanted to point out again, um, the books that you, oh, so the information that is on the plant list, you will all get in an email. The webinar will be available for you to watch again or for anyone else to watch. Um, you mentioned Doug Tallamy's 
three books, you may have written more than one. I will say, if you only have time for one book, Nature's Best Hope is a game changer. <laughs> it will convince you that what you do is unbelievably important and that you can start small, as Pam said, and then just keep adding. A um, couple things, the uh, Go Green Will Native Plant Sale is May 13th. We buy, they are inexpensive, they're small. That makes it easier for them to transplant. It also, you know, they they end up, I think, sometimes surviving better. I agree. Um, Pam, a lot of people get confused about the true native versus the cultivars. Most of what you'll find in a conventional nursery is a cultivar because they believe most clients want the new and improved versions. Um, how can someone who's shopping at chalet or uh, a conventional nursery how do we know what's a true native versus a cultivar? Well, again, I say go back to the Latin um, because the straight species will have the, the Latin name on there. And if, it, if it's a cultivar, it'll be, you know, in little kind of quotation marks, kind of. Um, so, yeah, that's that's it's just really referring back to the Latin, really sticking with that. And the, okay. I'm, I'm finding too that it's kind of, I compare it to eating organic food. <laughs> like when I started eating organic food in the late eighties, I went to one small shop in Evanston. That's the only place I could find it. Now it's everywhere. And I'm finding like native plants, it's getting a lot easier to find straight species um, natives. Like Lurvies carries quite a few, Pesci's carries quite a few, um, Chalet does too. And then, of course, all these native plant sales are fantastic. I would say that it's it, right. it's good to like a smartphone um, is really invaluable. Um, you know, take the time to look up the name that's on the tag. Exactly. Um, because I would say that while native plants are becoming more readily available at our favorite local nurseries, there's also a real problem with um misrepresentation in advertising, whether that's a problem with the grower or a problem with the nurseries. I'm not sure where the problem stems from exactly, but there are a lot of plants that are labeled as a native um, that is actually a cultivar. So um, I don't, it's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, sometimes yeah. it's fine. Um, yes. But but a lot of times if, if you're if you're on the hunt to really invest in straight natives, um, it's really important to, to look it up on your phone, look it up on the computer, um, know the difference between the, the cultivar name in, in quotations, um, because um, unfortunately there are a lot of companies and nurseries out there that are mislabeling their plants as natives when they're actually cultivars of the native. Yeah. Okay. So even though we could keep talking, we always do, you know, we, we uh, close down at eight 30. We're really at that time. So um, I want to remind people, if you want, if you can't make the native plant sale, there are others in the um, area, Google native plant sales in Chicago land, and you can find a list. Um, Go Grudel Med hosts a sustainable yard tour. It's July 16th this year. Um, it's a fabulous free way to get inspired by gardeners like Amanda that open their yards um, to all of us, come uh, come to the bird walks along the way. You'll see some beautiful native plants in Gilson Park that support the um, birds. Uh, Gogunamad also helped the park district put in a phenomenal bird habitat that's at the north end of Gilson Park. Take a stroll there anytime or come to one of our work days to learn more about that. Um, and so with that, I want to thank both Amanda and Pam Carlson for sharing your passion, your beauty with us. And um, I'm hoping that many of the people that have been watching this webinar will be inspired to uh, make some changes and, and have wonderful additions to their yards. And so with that, thank you very much. We're going to stop the recording. Thanks, Thanks Beth. Beth. Thanks, Pam.